Helen Keller was once asked if she could think of something worse than losing her eyesight. Yes, she immediately replied, losing my vision. This is Rifki Slenim in Binghamton, extremely humbled to send a few words to a group of people who I am sure are blinded by pain and worry, but are bolstered and carried by their vision. I remember this like it was today, when on the morning of my wedding, my Zayda, my grandfather, Olaf HaShalom, called me into his office and he said, the world thinks that you get married because you are in love, because you want a good life. But I want you to know when we get married, it's because that's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu asked of us. And in my youth and my idiocy, I remember not appreciating that and thinking to myself, why are you raining on my parade? Why are you bursting at my balloon? But you know what? All these years later, those words have stayed with me. And throughout the decades, I have understood successively more deeply what he was conveying. Because for us, marriage is much more than just a lifestyle choice. It is a mitzvah. The same is true of having children. The same is true for how we raise our children. It's all about something so much larger than ourselves. It seems to me that no one understands that better than you. 38 years ago on Shabbos Parshas Vayechi, the Rebbe spoke about Yaakov's parting words to Yosef. How Yaakov addressed the unspoken pain and perhaps anger that Yosef carried because Yaakov had, had not buried his mother, Rachel, in Hebron with all of the other Avot and Imahot. Rashi teaches that Yaakov took that opportunity to explain to Yosef that not he, but HaKadosh Baruch Hu had made that decision. So Rachel could be of assistance to her children when Nebuzaradan would take them into exile after the fall of Bayit Rishon. Surely, the Rebbe explained, knowing that she could be helpful to her children, Rachel happily gave up on her eternal repose with Yaakov and all of the other greats so she could be at the crossroads and watch over her children in their time of need. And in fact, it was she who extracted the promise from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Yes, sechar lefulosech, v'shavu banim ligvulam. There is a reward for your work, and the children shall return to their own borders. Yosef's upset was rooted in feeling that his mother had been wronged. But when he understood that this ultimately gave her joy to be there for her children, he was calmed and he no longer bore a grudge against his father. The Rebbe underscored that this Mesirat Nefesh of Rachel, her self-sacrifice in giving up something that was vastly important to her and would have meant a stellar type of personal benefit for the benefit of her children is an inherent spiritual quality and a modality of Jewish mothers. They are ready to give up everything to benefit their children. But you know what? My dear sisters, this is a special word to you, mother to mother. You have been called upon for a very specific, unusual type of Mesir Nefesh. Parents spend all of their lives trying to protect their children, especially mothers. And here you are supporting your children as they go into the line of fire to protect Hashem's children, the children of Rachel and Menu. May we immediately see the fulfillment of Hashem's words to Rachel. Restrain your eyes from weeping and your eyes from tears. For please God, there will no longer be a reason to cry very soon. Amen. A personal vignette. My husband and I have the great zuchut of directing the Ror Chabad Center for Jewish Student Life at Binghamton University. As soon as the war broke out, my son Levi, he and his wife Hadassah are one of four shluchim who staffed the Chabad Center at Binghamton University. Levi decided that it was important to put together a mission to Israel. And indeed, he was able to procure some of the first tickets that became available to non-combatants. And together with our son Mendel, led a group of Binghamton students, alumni, and parents on the Solidarity Mission. A very dear friend of mine penned a scathing letter to my husband and myself 
indicting us for putting not only our biological children, but members of our extended community in harm's way. I argued back that if our brothers and sisters in Israel had to live in danger, we could not just stand by. I also shared my heartfelt, my heartfelt belief that our days on this earth are allotted by God before our birth, and while we have a responsibility to do all that we can not to put ourselves in clear and obvious danger, we are ultimately not in control of our lives. She remained unconvinced. Sure enough, just a few hours after the group returned safely, Baruch Hashem, to the United States, my daughter-in-law, after a hurried hello and welcome back to her husband, put their girls in her car and went to New Jersey for a simcha. On her return, on the I-81, a deer came out of nowhere, charged and totaled her car. With Hashem's grace, with revealed miracles, and only in that fashion did they emerge from the car unscathed. Ultimately, we have no control. We are all, each one of us, no matter who we are and where we are, in Hashem's hands at every moment. But we do have control over one thing. We can choose to live a life in service of something larger than ourselves. To try as hard as we can to fulfill our life's mission and encourage our children to fulfill theirs. And that is what you are doing in an unparalleled manner. Even if and when our enemies blind us, like they most definitely did on October 7th, they can never, ever yank away our vision. In an attached clip to this one, I want you to listen to what the Rebbe of Lubavitch had to say about the singular contribution of the IDF of your children, of your spouses, of your parents serving the IDF. All I could say is, Ashrechem, Koltov, and Besurotovot.